Book Three, Chapter Five of Ben Hur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Ben Hur, A Tale of the Christ, by Lew Wallace. Book Three, Chapter Five. Every soul aboard, even the ship, awoke. Officers went to their quarters. The marines took arms and were led out, looking in all respects like legionaries. Sheaves of arrows and armfuls of javelins were carried on deck. By the central stairs the oil tanks and fireballs were set ready for use. Additional lanterns were lighted. Buckets were filled with water. The rowers in relief assembled under guard in front of the chief. As Providence would have it, Ben-Hur was one of the latter. Overhead he heard the muffled noises of the final preparations, of the sailors furling sail, spreading the nettings, unslinging the machines, and hanging the armor of bull-hide over the side. Presently quiet settled about the galley again, quiet full of vague dread and expectation, which, interpreted, means ready. At a signal passed down from the deck, and communicated to the hortator by a petty officer stationed on the stairs, all at once the oars stopped. What did it mean? Of the hundred and twenty slaves chained to the benches, not one but asked himself the question. They were without incentive. Patriotism, love of honour, sense of duty, brought them no inspiration— they felt the thrill common to men rushed helpless and blind into danger. It may be supposed the dullest of them, poising his oar, thought of all that might happen, yet could promise himself nothing, for victory would but rivet his chains the firmer, while the chances of the ship were his, sinking or on fire he was doomed to her fate. Of the situation without they might not ask, and who were the enemy— and what if they were friends, brethren, countrymen? The reader, carrying the suggestion forward, will see the necessity which governed the Roman when, in such emergencies, he locked the hapless wretches to their seats. There was little time, however, for such thought with them. A sound like the rowing of galleys astern attracted Ben-Hur, and the Astroia rocked as if in the midst of countering waves. The idea of a fleet at hand broke upon him, a fleet in manoeuvre, forming probably for attack. His blood started with the fancy. Another signal came down from the deck. The oars dipped, and the galley started imperceptibly. No sound from without, none from within, yet each man in the cabin instinctively poised himself for a shock. The very ship seemed to catch the sense and hold its breath, and go crouched, tiger-like. In such a situation time is inappreciable, so that Ben-Hur could form no judgment of distance gone. At last there was a sound of trumpets on deck, full, clear, long-blown. The chief beat the sounding board until it rang. The rowers reached forward full length, and, deepening the dip of their oars, pulled suddenly with all their united force. The galley, quivering in every timber, answered with a leap. Other trumpets joined in the clamour, all from the rear, none forward. From the latter quarter only a rising sound of voices in tumult, heard briefly. There was a mighty blow. The rowers in front of the chief's platform reeled. Some of them fell. The ship bounded back, recovered, and rushed on more irresistibly than before. Shrill and high arose the shrieks of men in terror, over the blare of trumpets and the grind and crash of the collision they arose. Then under his feet, under the keel, pounding, rumbling, breaking to pieces, drowning, Ben-Hur felt something overridden. The men about him looked at each other, afraid. A shout of triumph from the deck. The beak of the Roman had won. But who were they whom the sea had drunk? Of what tongue, from what land were they? No pause no stay. Forward rushed the Astroia, and, as it went, some sailors ran down, and, plunging the cotton balls into the oil tanks, tossed them dripping to comrades at the head of the stairs. Fire was to be added to other horrors of the combat. 
directly the galley heeled over so far that the oarsmen on the uppermost side with difficulty kept their benches. Again the hearty Roman cheer, and with it despairing shrieks. An opposing vessel, caught by the grappling hooks of the great crane swinging from the prow, was being lifted into the air that it might be dropped and sunk. The shouting increased on the right hand and on the left. Before, behind, swelled an indescribable clamour. Occasionally there was a crash, followed by sudden peals of fright, telling of other ships ridden down, and their crews drowned in the vortexes. Nor was the fight all on one side. Now and then a Roman in armour was borne down the hatchway, and laid bleeding, sometimes dying, on the floor. Sometimes also puffs of smoke, blended with steam, and foul with the scent of roasting human flesh, poured into the cabin, turning the dimming light into yellow murk. Gasping for breath the while, Ben-Hur knew they were passing through the cloud of a ship on fire, and burning up with the rowers chained to the benches. The Astroia all this time was in motion. Suddenly she stopped. The oars forward were dashed from the hands of the rowers, and the rowers from their benches. On deck, then, a furious trampling, and on the sides a grinding of ships afoul of each other. For the first time the beating of the gavel was lost in the uproar. Men sank on the floor in fear, or looked about seeking a hiding place. In the midst of the panic a body plunged or was pitched headlong down the hatchway, falling near Ben-Hur. He beheld the half-naked carcass, a mass of hair blackening the face, and under it a shield of bull-hide and wicker-work, a barbarian from the white-skinned nations of the north, whom death had robbed of plunder and revenge. How came he there? An iron hand had snatched him from the opposing deck. No. The Astroia had been boarded. The Romans were fighting on their own deck. A chill smote the young Jew. Arius was hard-pressed. He might be defending his own life. If he should be slain, God of Abraham forfend. The hopes and dreams so lately come— were they only hopes and dreams? Mother and sister? House? Home? Holy Land? Was he not to see them after all? The tumult thundered above him. He looked round. In the cabin all was confusion. The rowers on the benches paralyzed. Men running blindly hither and thither. Only the chief on his seat, imperturbable, vainly beating the sounding board, and waiting the orders of the tribune in the red murk illustrating the matchless discipline which had won the world. The example had a good effect upon Ben-Hur. He controlled himself enough to think. Honour and duty bound the Roman to the platform. But what had he to do with such motives then? The bench was a thing to run from, while if he were to die a slave, who would be the better of the sacrifice? With him living was duty, if not honour. His life belonged to his people. They arose before him never more real. He saw them, their arms outstretched. He heard them imploring him. And he would go to them. He started. Stopped. Alas, a Roman judgment held him in doom. While it endured, escape would be profitless. In the wide, wide earth there was no place in which he would be safe from the imperial demand. Upon the land none— nor upon the sea. Whereas he required freedom according to the forms of law, so only could he abide in Judea and execute the filial purpose to which he would devote himself. In other lands he would not live. Dear God! How had he waited and watched and prayed for such a release, and how it had been delayed! But at last he had seen it in the promise of the tribune. What else the great man's meaning— and if the benefactor so belated should now be slain, the dead come not back to redeem the pledges of the living. It should not be. Arius should not die. At least better perish with him than survive a galley slave. Once more Ben-Hur looked around. Upon the roof of the cabin the battle yet beat. Against the sides the hostile vessels yet crushed and grinded. On the benches the slaves struggled to tear loose from their chains, and, finding their efforts vain, howled like madmen. The guards had gone upstairs. Discipline was out, 
panic in. No. The chief kept his chair, unchanged, calm as ever, except the gavel, weaponless. Vainly with his clangor he filled the lulls and the din. Ben-Hur gave him a last look, then broke away, not in flight, but to seek the tribune. A very short space lay between him and the stairs of the hatchway aft. He took it with a leap, and was halfway up the steps, up far enough to catch a glimpse of the sky, blood-red with fire, of the ships alongside, of the sea covered with ships and wrecks, of the fight closed in about the pilot's quarter, the assailants many, the defenders few, when suddenly his foothold was knocked away, and he pitched backward. The floor, when he reached it, seemed to be lifting itself and breaking to pieces. Then, in a twinkling, the whole after part of the hull broke asunder, and, as if it had all the time been lying in wait, the sea, hissing and foaming, leaped in, and all became darkness and surging water to Ben-Hur. It cannot be said that the young Jew helped himself in this stress. Besides his usual strength, he had the indefinite extra force which nature keeps in reserve for just such perils to life. Yet the darkness, and the whirl and roar of water, stupefied him. Even the holding his breath was involuntary. The influx of the flood tossed him like a log forward into the cabin, where he would have drowned but for the refluence of the sinking motion. As it was, fathoms under the surface, the hollow mass vomited him forth, and he arose along with the loosed debris. In the act of rising he clutched something and held to it. The time he was under seemed an age longer than it really was. At last he gained the top. With a great gasp he filled his lungs afresh, and, tossing the water from his hair and eyes, climbed higher upon the plank he held, and looked about him. Death had pursued him closely under the waves. He found it waiting for him when he was risen, waiting multiform. Smoke lay upon the sea like a semi-transparent fog, through which here and there shone cores of intense brilliance. A quick intelligence told him that they were ships on fire. The battle was yet on, nor could he say who was victor. Within the radius of his vision, now and then, ships passed, shooting shadows athwart lights. Out of the dun clouds farther on he caught the crash of other ships, colliding. The danger, however, was closer at hand. When the Astroria went down, her deck, it will be recollected, held her own crew, and the crews of the two galleys which had attacked her at the same time, all of whom were engulfed. Many of them came to the surface together, and on the same plank or support of whatever kind continued the combat, begun possibly in the vortex fathoms down. Writhing and twisting in deadly embrace, sometimes striking with sword or javelin, they kept the sea around them in agitation, at one place inky black, at another aflame with fiery reflections. With their struggles he had nothing to do. They were all his enemies. Not one of them but would kill him for the plank upon which he floated. He made haste to get away. About that time he heard oars in quickest motion, and beheld a galley coming down upon him. The tall prow seemed doubly tall, and the red light playing upon its gilt and carving gave it an appearance of snaky life. Under its foot the water churned to flying foam. He struck out, pushing the plank, which was very broad and unmanageable. Seconds were precious. Half a second might save or lose him. In the crisis of the effort, up from the sea, within arm's reach, a helmet shot like a gleam of gold. Next came two hands with fingers extended. Large hands were they, and strong. Their hold, once fixed, might not be loosed. Ben-Hur swerved from them appalled. Up rose the helmet and the head it encased, then two arms, which began to beat the water wildly. The head turned back and gave the face to the light, the mouth gaping wide, the eyes open but sightless, and the bloodless pallor of a drowning man, never anything more ghastly. Yet he gave a cry of joy at the sight, and as the face was going under again he caught the sufferer by the chain which passed from the helmet beneath the chin, and drew him to the plank. The man was Arius, the tribune. 
For a while the water foamed and eddied violently about Ben-Hur, taxing all his strength to hold to the support, and at the same time keep the Roman's head above the surface. The galley had passed, leaving the two barely outside the stroke of its oars. Right through the floating men, over heads helmeted as well as heads bare, she drove, in her wake nothing but the sea, sparkling with fire. A muffled crash, succeeded by a great outcry, made the rescuer look again from his charge. A certain savage pleasure touched his heart. The Astroia was avenged. After that the battle moved on. Resistance turned to flight. But who were the victors? Ben-Hur was sensible how much his freedom and the life of the Tribune depended upon that event. He pushed the plank under the latter until it floated him, after which all his care was to keep him there. The dawn came slowly. He watched its growing hopefully, yet sometimes afraid. Would it bring the Romans or the pirates? If the pirates, his charge was lost. At last morning broke in full, the air without a breath. Off to the left he saw the land, too far to think of attempting to make it. Here and there men were adrift like himself. In spots the sea was blackened by charred and sometimes smoking fragments. A galley up a long way was lying to with a torn sail hanging from the tilted yard and the oars all idle. Still farther away he could discern moving specks, which he thought might be ships in flight or pursuit, or there might be white birds a-wing. An hour passed thus. His anxiety increased. If relief came not speedily, Arius would die. Sometimes he seemed already dead, he lay so still. He took the helmet off, and then, with greater difficulty, the cuirass. The heart he found fluttering. He took hope at the sign and held on. There was nothing to do but wait, and, after the manner of his people, pray. End of chapter.